I chose this title, why do we want to inspire universities, uh, and especially you, to do, re uh, to do uh, research. Um, because I think, and it's also my background, I have a humanities background, not a finance background. Uh, for me, a uh, university is a kind of checks and balances in our society. Uh, so it has to do with freedom, but also with critical thinking. And that's something which is lost on the way a little bit, I guess. Um, so uh, you have a lot of theoretical stuff and then you have companies. Uh, and especially in the Netherlands, uh, we are very advanced in leadership and organizational stuff, etc. Uh, but I'm always amazed that uh, nearly all the people, especially in the Netherlands, they only read uh, Harvard uh, Business Review articles. So no French literature anymore, uh, no German literature anymore. Uh, and that makes it very difficult because the roots of our society are very European continental. So I try to... Uh, to tell you something about this. Uh, and I hope we'll find back to these roots and do research on our own roots, uh, especially because the Netherlands is very, very interesting for uh, if you talk about organizational stuff. Okay, so I will uh, talk a little bit um, about the company, but also a little bit of our way of thinking, which especially from a research uh, point of view could be interesting. And then I tell something about the kind of uh, structure or we call it clock building. So what's the whole hierarchy of our model? Um, purpose, people first. Also put something in about primus inter pares. Uh, so that's more about uh, leadership. Uh, something about radical transparency. It was already mentioned. Uh, it's, 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 it's less for us in the company because people in our company know what we do. But if we do talks, let's say at the university, w which is funded with public money, we always have the opinion that it should be accessible. So for instance, we don't support any research which is not publicly accessible. Um, uh, and I'll tell something about scaling tools uh, because uh, we are doing a lot also on, on scaling uh, because especially scale-ups is a huge problem, not startups, but scale-ups. Uh, scale and want to, um, want to share the experiences. And actually, we were, we were as a company a couple of years ago, uh, we were in a scaling program of the University of Amsterdam, uh, ACE, and uh, Anushka. Uh, we know each other from a, a journey to Silicon Valley, of all places. And that's a very good example because everybody goes to Silicon Valley and nobody goes in the other direction in Europe, which I find very funny in a way. Okay. Um, uh, very short about the company, um, normally you don't know us because we don't, let's say, do a lot of talks on media or uh, we're not a startup bootcamp company of 24-year-old people who met each other during the weekend. Um, the founders know each other since 2002 and we're still together, uh, which is quite exceptional and we are typically very old-fashioned small, medium enterprise culture. So grown with our own stuff, no external money, which is an exception nowadays. Uh, we're 40 people now, 7,000 clients. We're doing mortgage advice, which is a huge market. It's more than 100 billion a year. If you talk about the amount of uh, mortgages, which is, uh, which is done in a year. We did 2.5 until now, it's, it's, it's not a lot. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of money, uh, but uh, as this market is so huge, uh, it's a, a big fragmented market and the main players, you know, are hypotheca and this kind of stuff. And we are a small, I would say, more qualitative type of company. Uh, Trustpilot, because people like this kind of stuff, 4.9. And uh, somebody asked me before, yes, we're still 100% owners. Uh, I know private equity very, very well, uh, and that's why I try to avoid it. So, um, especially in the beginning. Uh, and if people like this topic, there are also topics online uh, and lectures on, uh, on, let's say, scaling companies and uh, the way of financing. Uh, last week I did one uh, for Hyperloop and Lightyear, uh, which I think are um, uh, pretty interesting companies. Okay. 
if people know each uh, us, then it's mainly uh, because we are a number one great place to work. So it's about um, yeah this kind of awards, uh, um, and we are always focused on being best workplace. But it's also because of our model. But I'll explain it later. So ma the main awards are uh, awards about um, yeah, being a great employer. And then we have growth awards. So if you grow more than 20% every year, you're automatically in this kind of list. So you, it's, it's not a kind of qualitative, um, let's say, reward, uh, because it just depends, for instance, on also external money a lot of companies have, and then you can, then you can just uh, grow more than 20%. So let's say the interesting awards are the, are the awards on the left side. Um, first, I want to tell something about, let's say, the intellectual thing. Um, for me personally, the company is not about mortgages. I mean, we do mortgages, but it's a kind of intellectual play. So I'm, I didn't study economics. I mean, I wrote a thesis on economics, but I didn't study economics. I don't see myself as somebody who studied economics. Uh, and for me, a company is a possibility of trying to implement certain scientific uh, thesis. Uh, and then the nice thing is because we work in a company, we can adapt all the time. So I don't have the discussion. Now you're, you only know about theory now because when I'm in the office, I am able to implement it and adjust to it. So that's what I like. But let's say when I finished university, uh, I also could have stayed at university for postdoc or this kind of stuff, but I ended up being an entrepreneur, um, but still like this intellectual uh, exercise. So we often work with a lot of, let's say, questions which are a little bit counterintuitive. So for instance, if, if we talk about growth, uh, we ask exactly the opposite. Or if you talk about organizational structures, and you say, no, it should be bigger and faster. Then for instance, we always ask, should it be much smaller? As small is beautiful. Or uh, should, should processes be slower? Uh, uh, which is a little bit counterintuitive because people always say, no, you have to be faster, you have to blitz scale and this kind of stuff. And so perhaps let's have a look at other parts of society because for instance, our institutional background is a slow democracy. Uh, you have the Senate to slow down processes to increase the quality, for instance. Um, but also, for instance, how, how, how far can you reach with the company? Eh? This Af African saying, it's not about being very fast, but keeping the people together to get as far, far as possible. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of different way of uh, uh, thinking because you also see that companies don't survive very long. And it's, and it's this periods of time becoming shorter and shorter. So this is our model. Uh, took us quite a bit. Um, it's about uh, hierarchy of stakeholders, uh, and this is a little bit older. Right? It's not, let's say, since yesterday. Yeah? We're working with this ten years. Um, now everybody talks about stakeholders, and uh, even CEO of Morgan Stanley, uh, and this kind of people say, okay, it should be more than only shareholder value. But we always said. It's always about our own people, and they come first. And although we have clients, and we are business to consumer, uh, it's, our own, it's on our website that our clients are second. So every client who approaches us sees, oh, I'm second. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, we try to explain this. There's also a video of Richard Branson uh, on the website to, to show why we do this. Uh, but if there is a kind of conflict, between different goals, it's always our own people. So for instance, we don't advise late in the evening or during weekends, uh, because we say if somebody can have an appointment for the dentist, uh, we don't understand if this is a very important decision in somebody's life, why people are not able to make a normal appointment during the week. So it's about really about people first. Um, and if your own people are happy, your clients are happy. That's why I added this trust pilot indicator. So we have a much higher, uh, let's say, rewards of our clients than our competitors, although our people are first. 
uh, and shareholders come last, um, uh, which is easy because we are the shareholders. 10% is reserved for our people, but we don't have this conflict as that external people try to explain us how to run the business because in most cases they just don't know what we're really doing. Uh, especially if you talk about private equity in the Netherlands because the market is just too small and not professional enough. So um, we want to keep it that way as long as possible. So that's the model and then you have a kind of flying wheel uh, for those people who like Jim Collins. Uh, that, that's our flying wheel. It's clock building, not time telling. Um, yeah, and then you'll progress all the time and start to make it better. The starting point, however, is uh, purpose-driven. So uh, a company has a goal in society. It's not about shareholder value. It's not about maximizing profits. That's something which could follow, uh, but shouldn't be the starting point. Uh, and I think from a historical point of view, that probably when we're 25 or 50 years later, we will see this period of time since Milton Friedman wrote this article in the New York Times and this declaration of the 200 American CEOs as a kind of exception uh, in the last 2000 years of doing business. Um, um, because there has never been a time which was, which was so focused on only one stakeholder. And you can't focus on one stakeholder, it never will work out in the, long, in the long run. I personally thought that the whole thing would collapse during the financial crisis, so I was really amazed it took 10 years longer. Uh, but I think it's just, it's just not sustainable. It's like the whole climate debate, it's just not sustainable. So this is the main, main purpose about the financial sector, but we have a double purpose. We also think that the way people work is also kind of an enemy, or how do you call this, a kind of exception. Uh, that 80 or 85% go to work and they don't like it. Uh, that's why you have all those burnouts, etc. So it's a very strange way that we spend most time at work, even more time than at home or with our families, and people are not happy. Although I don't like the, work, uh, the word happy, uh, I like the word fulfillment, but it's also kind of this kind of American culture. Uh, because happiness is rather superficial uh, and fulfillment or passion is much more profound. Uh, passion also means suffering. And uh, life shouldn't be happy, life should be about fulfillment. So we want to create an environment where people find fulfillment. It's not about happiness. Um, and this is as important as the first part of of let's say the company purpose. Um, a personal remark, uh, because um, uh, I think that's important. Uh, I didn't talk about this in the past, but when I talk about purpose and the discussions went on, I always ended up to explain, for instance, also about happiness. Um, I've been very ill uh, when I was 20, I had cancer, and uh, I had a chance of surviving of 20%, so that makes life very easy afterwards. So. The best thing which can happen is people have severe illnesses when they're very young and they survive them uh, because afterwards you have a kind of mental freedom. But it's, you see a lot of people who are, let's say, doing very purpose-driven stuff. There always is something in their biographies because they have a, a different way of seeing the world and it's not about material stuff. I, I'm totally... I find it totally uninspiring, but most people find it uninspiring. Uh, it's, it's much about something much bigger, but we have, we have lost this idea. Uh, and I mean, I have a historical background. Um, perhaps we should put skulls back on our tables, uh, which was the case in the past. In the Middle Ages, everybody had a skull on the table. Just to be reminded, re memento mori, it's not about you. It's about eternity or about making the society much better than it is. And uh, that's a totally different approach. So I was thinking to put something like this in the office, but it's still interesting that we, we don't like these topics. Eh? We don't like death. Uh, we don't want to discuss this. We want to stay young forever, eh? forever young. 
uh, this song. And, and, and I think uh, perhaps climate change will help this. Perhaps the virus will uh, change this. Uh, where we find out that it's a little bit more about other stuff. In this virus topic, it's very interesting uh, that the role of the state is very decisive. So it's very interesting what will happen in the US because they don't have a health system or a proper health system. How will they deal with this, uh, with this virus? So probably the states where the state has a bigger influence and it doesn't have to be communist like China, but where things are very well organized and you have a multi-stakeholder approach, perhaps they can deal much better with this. Could be interesting discussion. Um, yeah, I searched, I searched uh, a picture just to, to show this wholeness um, and to say some, something a little bit more about it. We have a people first principle uh, and that could be interesting uh, research topic as well. The problem is that in the past HR, we don't like the word HR because it's not human resources. It's also funny, for instance, that uh, in the Dutch language, you don't translate it because if you would translate it, you would stop using this ter uh, ter uh, terminology. And you wouldn't say menselijke grondstoffen because it's just a way of, a way of uh, absolute showing that there, is, there isn't any respect for uh, the human beings. Eh? So, Personnel zaken is, is something which has another quality than human resources. But in this whole topic, it's seen as mixing capital uh, and HR and then other stuff. And then you mix it and then you maximize profits. But it's not, it's about this. It's about uh, being human. Uh, and uh, which also means, for instance, in the company, um, HR in the hierarchy is higher than line management. So HR decides if somebody can work. And uh, we have, for instance, also the principle family first. So people first is more important than the company and family first is much more important than the revenues. Um, then for those who are re doing research on this stuff, um, what I find interesting is that, let's say from a scientific point of view, you could stop a lot of discussions uh, you could stop bonus discussions because you know it's counterproductive uh, you could take this one uh, as an example i uh, relate to this for instance um, but there is a huge gap between what science does uh, and i still wonder if those people who are in big boards of big companies it's also in a very practical way you can read it in harvard business review but i always think do they put this in the garbage can afterwards, because if you read about bonuses, which are, for instance, counterproductive, you would just say next time when you enter a bank building, shall we just abolish it? Because I just read it's counterproductive and there is enough scientific proof of that. So although the Netherlands is not doing uh, a bad job, so the banking uh, industry is on a lot of topics, self-organization or uh, financial schemes, much more advanced than a, lo than a lot of other uh, countries. But it's still interesting that the scientific insights are there in a very early stage, and then it takes pretty long before it's applied. So great job for you eh, if you talk about applied science to, uh, to, to let's say, fasten uh, this, this process, because it's, it, to my point of view, it takes too long. Uh, so I, I mean, I, it's not my job to, to dive into this model deeper, but that's, let's say, our main model. And if we want to make it a little bit more interesting, we, we always say, watch the video of Daniel Pink, uh, Drive, uh, because it's nice to look at and much easier than reading this kind of stuff. But it's, it's exactly the same. Um, then for those who, uh, who uh, do ethics, we already talked about it. It's very simple. Uh, we have one rule. It's a golden rule. We don't have any other rules. So we try to avoid to write the stuff down. And it's the discussion between the compliance side and the, the values side. So very continental European. Uh, it's about values. And uh, it's very important to focus on those values because otherwise people say, no, it's not in the book. For instance, tax law is a very good example. We have accepted that somebody is searching for a new possibility to avoid taxes. But that's not 
that's not the intention of taxes. So it should be much more about ethics. Uh, and um, we say, if you don't know something, just ask your colleagues. Because this collective intelligence is so huge that especially when it's focused on values, you will always find a solution. And in, practi in practice, it means also could be interesting topic. Um, the question always is, yeah, how do you do this? So we, when we have a kind of situation where we think, okay, no, that's not the way it should be. Then we ask somebody, think about it. How would you like to be dealt with in this situation? We send those people home and then they can answer it the day afterwards. And most of the times they say, sorry, um, I understand. And if they don't, perhaps they should think a day longer, but you have a cultural fit problem. So it's always about cultural fit. It's always about values. And because of the fact that we have the, the shares, we never compromise on values. So especially in the beginning, it costs a huge amount of money uh, because you, yeah, you just say to certain people, this is the way it works here. If you don't like it, you should go work somewhere else. Uh, and you end up with a very, very strong culture. And all the people who advise, they are all homegrown. So nobody ever advised for a bank. Because we also don't want to have these kind of discussions. Uh, so it's very, very, very strongly based on values. Um, holacracy, radical transparency and growth. Uh, uh, for those who are familiar with, um, with these topics, uh, I'll put it very shortly. Uh, everything which is huge and complex is self-organizing. So Frederick Laloux, but also people who study ecosystems, biology, market economy. What I find always very interesting is that the market economy is self-organizing. Uh, people decide about prices. And then if you talk about management, you have a kind of communist system. You have a planned economy, so to say. It's a, a very strange that, that, that we don't see this kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, strange situation. I mean, it's not another discipline. So you learn macroeconomics and you talk about decentralized decision making, and then you move into another classroom, microeconomics, and then you do exactly the opposite. I, I haven't un really understood this. So holacracy, um, we talked about it, uh, Dutch invention. Uh, so not American invention. I, I, last week I also got another student who wanted to write uh, a paper on our company. And then uh, she told me that um, in the university, uh, and it was in Rotterdam, so uh, not your university, uh, they read this article about Sappos in the Harvard Business Review and I said it was just defended around the corner, sociocracy, Endenburg. Um, and it is a reaction on the, on the First World War. Perhaps we come to that afterwards. And it is a human invention. So it's not a lean type of efficiency program. No, it it's, has a human background. Um, this is open. I will tell something about it afterwards. Uh, so it's publicly accessible. Um, then for those who study leadership, um, I'm totally opposite, uh, or I don't like the whole American way of strong CEOs. It's exactly the opposite, which you should have. Um, but that also has to do with my institutional background. So for me, management is a very young discipline. It's 100 years old. Uh, politics or philosophy is 20 or 30 times exist longer. So if you want to know how you organize something in a multi-stakeholder environment, uh, then you should watch how states are built. And then you find Montesquieu and checks and balances and this kind of stuff. Uh, but the problem is that those disciplines are, are so narrow uh, so that people don't see this kind of comparisons. And that's, that's a huge problem. Um, so, for instance, we are testing since uh, I think two years now, Primus Inter Paris, uh, first among equals. And then I do interviews and people say, oh, that's very innovative. That's uh, very interesting. And I say, mm, it's Athens 2000 years ago. Um, uh, so, so the exception is the strong CEO. 
<coughs> and when I do interviews uh, in the Netherlands, I always say, if you say it in German, everybody understands immediately what the problem is. We brauchen einen starken Führer. That's, that's the, the huge problem. Or if you talk to people who do uh, science on the brain, you know that if you have a very, that if you have very strong leadership, it's a huge risk for your whole company. And the more successful somebody is, the higher the risk is, because somebody thinks that mostly the men, uh, and mo mostly a male, male problem, um, that, that they have the right answer on all the questions. Um, so I took just two pictures because it's also in our history, if you take for instance the Dutch Republican tradition of organizing, uh, these are always the citizens of the city. So the whole tradition of the Hansa or also Amsterdam with the Night Watch, the citizens were governing and it was a primus inter pares principle. It's not, we don't have a royal aristocracy, aristocracy tradition. So what I find interesting is that everything which is on complex organizational systems should be a main topic of the Dutch. So it's no coincidence that, for instance, the yearly Congress of Holacracy is done in Amsterdam because there are much more Dutch companies. It's very close to the Polder model as well, in a positive way. This is, by the way, Hamburg. Uh, Hamburg. Um, um, and you also had it in the German, the German uh, uh, companies for a long time. Then it was, for instance, um, Sprecher des Vorstandes. So it was Speaker of the Board. It was not a strong CEO, and it were b huge boards. So totally different tradition. Uh, and I also have an example from the present, because otherwise they say, no, no, this is museum stuff. This is the Swiss government. Uh, I also studied comparative politics uh, in Leiden, and, and uh, we had to learn France and America and England, etc. But we never um, had to learn the Swiss democratic system, which I find the most interesting, because all the parties are always in the government, which is totally counterintuitive. It's not 50% plus one. And their government uh, has a rotation principle. So every year, somebody else is the chancellor of the government, which makes it a little bit difficult if they, if they are invited somewhere. Um, um, and that's, that, that's very funny. But it's not, it's not studied. Uh, and why is this the case? Because it's a very old principle. And if you then see, let's say from the whole tradition that you want to measure stuff, uh, if I discuss with, with Americans, they always want to measure. And I say, okay, okay let's take uh, OECD uh, tables. What shall we measure? Life expectancy, uh, criminality, uh, how happy children are, it uh, doesn't matter what, you can choose. It's always Scandinavia. The Scandinavian country is always one until four. Then sometimes the Netherlands is five, Switzerland, etc. It's always stable. And we always talk about measuring. And I say, okay, why don't we take Scandinavia as an example? Or when I ask, is there somebody who knows only one chancellor of a Scandinavian country, I never had a correct answer, because nobody knows. So it's interesting, there's also, let's say that's, that's not an exception, but the question is, why are countries or societies which are so totally stable, and I'll use the word happy, pretty happy, why don't we know who is in charge of those countries? And companies are exactly the same, by the way. If you, talk, if you take very long term, and you say, okay, what's the expectancy of companies? The companies will really survive, let's say, for more than a century. It's also pretty decentralized. And companies who are extreme, GE is a very good example. Huh? Jack Welch died last week. Uh, they don't survive those cycles. So, could be interesting topic. Um, then radical transparency, so we are totally transparent, so this, this stuff is online, our talks are online, 
um, our organizational structure is online and we think it helps a lot. Also, it helps us because if something is online um, and you have a kind of, let's say, you have a kind of purpose or it's very clear where you are, uh, you have these checks and balances. It's like that open bar at Bastille, for instance. Uh, it's for a kind of democracy, it's very important that things are openly accessible, but for companies it's exactly the same, so everybody can find stuff. Um, so, w we have just turned it the other way around, everything is publicly accessible, uh, accessible or there should be a very severe reason why it's not. So let's say client data about mortgages are not accessible. And that's but it, everybody understands that. But for instance, what do we do? You can just click on this link and you can, you can all the teams, because these are departments, you can click in those uh, departments. You can see what, which roles there are, who is responsible, what are the accountabilities, everything is totally open. But it's like, it's like in, in the state where also, uh, let's say a lot of stuff is uh, accessible. Um, also, the salaries are open. Uh, we're working on this because we have a privacy topic to solve. Um, but this is a salary model. Uh, and everybody knows what you will earn also in future. And we totally split salary and performance, which is also counterintuitive. Because everybody says, then we know that bonuses are counterproductive. But if we say we split it, because we just went further, then everybody says, but how do, how do you do, uh, how, do, how do you manage underperformance? And we say, okay, now we do it horizontally. Peer pressure is much stronger than vertical feedback. But it's still really, really difficult. So the press is mainly interested in transparency. And they ask the question, what was the reaction of your colleagues, etc.? And there the discussion stops. So it's very difficult for me to go beyond and say, okay, shall we discuss splitting performance and salaries? And salaries are raised every year automatically. Because people are not able to move out or to leave this mental box. It's just not possible. So I really hope you as researchers will work on this topic because I really don't know how to solve this. Uh, Although the starting point is, or always has been like this, our society also has this, this principle. It's not the output principle, it's the input principle. So as long as you're not an asshole, and so we have no asshole culture, there is enormous acceptance for totally different ways of, let's say, adding value to society or to a company. But we think that performance or to measure performance is carrot stick idea. We don't get it out of our heads. So perhaps multi-stakeholder, we're nearly there now. Uh, but but this mental box is really, really, really difficult to uh, to solve. Um, so this will be um, also online. And what we also do, for instance, just a very simple a, a simple thing, is that when people apply we say them in advance what they will earn. So we, for instance, we don't like it that people do a lot of talks or a, little, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, meet a lot of people in the company and in the end they say, mm, no, we're only paying you this or that or what do you think, etc." This whole way of, it's, it's not a very fair way of treating people, especially if you are the stronger one as an employer, it should be the other way around. Or for instance, our, our law system, is, is organized like that. If you have labor law, uh, then you will defend somebody who is in a weaker situation. Here it's exactly the other way around. We don't, we don't realize this. So if I would be in government, I would say, you have to tell in advance what you will earn because it's not a fair, it's not a fair way of dealing uh, with people. I don't see any research on this stuff. Um, then something about scaling tools, because I knew, okay, entrepreneurial stuff. Um, uh, there's also a lot of stuff online, because we were in this Amsterdam scaling program. 
Then we were in Scaling Up Nation of Think. Uh, last year we were in uh, TechShare of Euronext, uh, the stock exchange. And we are in TechLeap now. I'm, I also are in a kind of work, working group uh, for, uh, um, uh, let's say, capital and assessment. Um, but we work with a lot of tools. So if people are interested in this, uh, thinking the opposite, um, always invert. Uh, this is the best friend of Buffett for those people uh, who know him. Um, or nobody else would do, zero to one, Peter Thiel, which I find one of the most interesting entrepreneurs, much more interesting than Elon Musk, for instance. Um, then we do uh, exponential growth. So everything we do, we ask, would it work if the company would be 100 times bigger? Uh, and and if, we, if we can't say yes, we just evolve on that. Um, so we are, the whole idea is you should be able to scale. So we don't have any any salary negotiations, uh, not at the beginning, not during people are on board. It's all, it just doesn't exist. So it's reduced to the max. Um, uh, and from other disciplines, sometimes you know this. So if you talk to designers uh, and you say less is more, then people know immediately what you mean. But if you build bigger companies, it becomes more and more complex. And if you say that less is more, then somebody says, no, no, that's not possible. And you add stuff and stuff. And then afterwards it works, it doesn't work again. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff also online. Um, um, I will add also a lot, of, um, a lot of different topics. But I really hope that if people are doing research on these topics that they, um, they are able to find us. Thank you. <laughs>